Welcome to the Smith and Rowland Show. Let's join our host, Alan Smith and Jeff Rowland. Guest it, ladies and gentlemen. It's now time for the Smith and Rowland podcast. My name is Jeff Rowland. You will become aware of my eloquence and the silky smooth tones of my voice <laughs> as the texture of my wisdom just pours out. But before we get to that, let me introduce to you Alan Smith. Yes, it might be good that somebody explains what the texture of your wisdom really means. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> well, I don't know. I was hoping we could get somebody. Well, see uh, what that was. I like that, that, was... like that introduction. I really like it. Oh, I thought it was good. What no. you really call that is, is what people call a word salad. And I did that in commemoration of the new Democrat nominee for president, oh. Ms. Kamala Harris. She's known yeah. for word salads. Where you use is. a bunch of words and say nothing. She must own a produce stand, all I know. <laughs> <laughs> I you know, think she, she does. She, she, can put bring it out. she can put her out there. I'm telling you yeah. what's the truth. Well, we've got us an article here this morning, I, or this afternoon it is now, Jeff, that you had talked about that you fell in love with. Yeah. You want to go ahead and introduce this article since you well, liked it so much? Al Perota on the stream, he's a very good writer. He has this column called The Brew. He wrote an article on one way having Kamala Harris in the presidential race is a good thing. That a intrigued good thing. me. Hmm. Yeah, he said there's a bright side of Kamala Harris being the Democrat nominee. He describes it this way, and in the first paragraph, it gives us something that I would like for us to discuss it says Kamala Harris has now collected enough delegates to assure her the Democratic presidential nomination without any voter ever voting for her. Wow. That's, yeah, I, would like, well, wow. I would like for us to discuss that just a little bit, if we could. Hmm. How do you do that? I thought that's what they would need to do at the Democratic National Convention. This sounds like they've somebody has picked her and already put the votes in her pocket before all the delegations have even been brought into the process. I just think it's ironic that for months now we've been hearing that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy, and now we see a, a real threat to democracy in action by the Democrat elites just putting Kamala Harris in as the one running for president. And no, none of the voters, none of the people has ever voted for her. Had to say so. I mean, yeah. Nobody's ever had well, to say now, so. Well, now, now isn't that interesting? So I just well, thought that was a little bit ironic. But it is. The delegates, what they say has happened or what's been reported is that when Joe Biden announced that he was stepping aside, Kamala Harris got on the telephone, started calling all the delegates and the senators and Congress, and she got the support of the delegates uh, prior to the convention. What I understand is that they're having a virtual roll call of the delegates okay. before the convention, and, and they're going to go ahead and nominate her as the, the presidential nominee. So it does look like it's going to be a Trump-Kamala Harris presidential race. And that's done without anybody ever voting for it. I, I don't understand that part. This is not the first time that this has happened. As a matter of fact, it's like the third time. If you remember, Alan, when Hillary Clinton was running, Bernie Sanders was challenging her and in many ways was beating her. And some say that the convention elites stepped in and took that nomination away from Bernie Sanders. Then mm -hmm. in this past primary, they run Robert Kennedy plumb out of the party because he was going to run against Joe Biden in the primaries. That mm -hmm. wasn't allowed, so they run him plumb out of the party. Mm -hmm. Now Joe Biden has stepped aside, and no voter has even voted for Kamala Harris, but suddenly she is the new Democrat nominee to run for president. <laughs> wow. I just wonder how that works. If they're worried about a threat to democracy, maybe they need to look in their own backyard. Uh, well, I think it's obvious that there's just an elite few that call the shots in the Democratic Party. I mean, and this is proof that there's just a few calling the shots. Oh, yeah. And, they, and yeah. they wave their magic wand, and it just so happens here it is. That second paragraph there, I think, is enlightened. It says, we've spoken over the past couple of days of the radical policy disaster that is Kamala Harris. We've spoken of her rivaling 
Cruella de Villa as a boss. Now, Cruella, do you know who that person is? No, yet? I, I don't know who that is. Now, Cruella de Villa, uh, she was just a character. You've heard of 101 Dalmatians, a Disney movie. 100, if you got grandchildren or children, they would like that little black and white spotted firehouse dogs we used to call. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cruella de Villa, she played a, her character was cruel and evil. Like the devil. Yeah, okay. So here, here he's saying that Kamala Harris would drop shade on her. Cruel de Villa. He's saying that. I would agree with him, and I don't know the character. But, uh, <laughs> well, you know, well, watch, if you watch the movie, you would easily say, oh, there's, there's Kamala. Okay. But anyway. <laughs> there she ahead. is in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. I will uh, say when, you know, his articles over the past couple of days about the radical policy disaster that is Kamala Harris. Most people may not know this, but she started out as the district attorney in San Francisco. She refused to impose strict punishment and penalty guidelines mm -hmm. on criminals there. Then she goes to the Senate. Here's the interesting thing. She was only in the Senate for a short period of time. When Bernie Sanders was running against Hillary Clinton, even the Democrats said Bernie Sanders is too far to the left. Bernie even declared himself as a democratic socialist. Right. Kamala Harris's voting record was more liberal than Bernie Sanders was oh my when she served in the Senate. She was voted as the most liberal senator in America during her term there as, as in the Senate. Then she ran for president and had to bow out of the primaries before they got to Iowa, and Joe Biden then picked her as the vice president. Mm -hmm. We have someone in the same fashion as AOC running against Donald Trump for president. Here's the danger, and I'm just posing this to you. We talked a little bit about this this morning. Here's a danger for me. It appears to me that most Americans are more personality-centered than they are policy-centered. Mm -hmm. It appears that we're making our judgments based off of presentation instead of policy. Most mm -hmm. people don't even study what the policies are or even know what the issues are that we're faced with. And because of that, they look at a Donald Trump and they say, we don't like him. And they don't like him because he sends out tweets or calls somebody a name. But they don't look at his policies. Kamala Harris, on the other hand, fits all of the profile of what you would call a well-groomed politician right. in that she can, she can read a teleprompter really well, but she, her stance on the issues and her policies are to the left of what Joe Biden's has been. So it is a scary thing. I don't know, you know, what we're supposed to do about that. But it does appear to me that, that that seems to be the problem. A lot of Christian people who don't like Donald Trump or who hate Donald Trump, by not voting for Donald Trump, you are in essence giving Kamala Harris your support, and mm -hmm. you are supporting issues that are anti-God, anti-Bible, and anti-American, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Well, I would have to totally agree with your conclusions there, Mr. Rowland goes down in this next paragraph here and says, If you're a fan of history and festiveness of American presidential campaigns, you can at least now hope for a campaign that revives the spirit of the campaigns of old. With the ill and bitter Biden, that was not going to happen. Now, is he trying to present here that, uh, Kamala's now in the race. Is I, that think what that's, I think that's what he's saying is the bright spot wow. to this. Oh, is that I think he's trying to say that with Biden and Trump, it, it wasn't going to be much of a campaign, and now at least we have some kind of a spirited campaign. I'll be honest with you, I view it as more of a danger than a good thing. The next paragraph says, with Harris running around the country trailed by all manner of vapid celebrities, and Trump being Trump, we're looking at the likelihood 
of a more lively and robust fall. Let's be real, he says, even hearing Kamala laugh at inappropriate times will be better for our psyches than being constantly yelled at by Joe Biden (laughs) as we anxiously worry whether this will be the day he topples over. (laughs) So, I mean, I understand what he's trying to say. In some ways, I agree with the format of what he's writing, but I don't agree that this is necessarily a good thing for the country. I don't think that a major political party that would nominate someone so progressively left that she borders on democratic socialism and for sure the woke mentality, that's what she's about. And to have that as a choice against Donald Trump, I think it's a dangerous situation for the country. I think we would have been much better off if Robert Kennedy Jr. had a been asked to take the Democrat nomination, yeah. and, and you would have had at least some depth in understanding of the issues that were presented with. This uh, same article, Jeff, goes down a little bit here, and I am not really don't really understand this. Do you see that in blue there? I do. Is that part of this article, I guess? Yeah, no? it is. It is part of the article. Well, it's, bring, it's, bring it's it a in. Su- it's a subtitle, and to be honest, it's so... Disheartening. Well, as we were saying this morning, Alan, it's basically disgusting. That's the word you and I got hung up on this morning. We're just getting. I'm getting disgusted. Was, yeah, yeah. We we're just so disgusted that we yeah. couldn't think of a worse word. Yeah. To describe uh, how we feel. Yeah. This this subheading in this article it's almost a different topic, but it says a crazy few days at the Southern Baptist Convention. ERLC president fired then not fired over a Biden post. So he posted something about Joe Biden, and he was calling Joe Biden patriotic for stepping aside. But, you know. There goes your Southern Baptist conventions, all I got Well, and, you know, we just was looking at an article on one of our news feeds on KingdomPropheticSociety.org. For all of you that are listening, please go there, join. It doesn't cost you nothing. And you can get kind of all these news feeds. And then you can hear all of the eloquent talk from myself and Alan Smith, where we will answer the world's questions and solve everybody's problems. <laughs> there was another article on one of our feeds about the Presbyterian Church just making it mandatory oh that's right. for anybody that's ordained in the Presbyterian Church. It's going to become mandatory that they accept homosexuality as an alternative lifestyle that nice. should be fine. Jeff, I'm sorry. That's not Christian. That's pagan. That's we right. can't really call the Presbyterians a Christian church. You have to call it a no, pagan church. That's exactly right. If because they go that's to that what extreme, it is. That's it is what a pagan. It is. It's just yes. pagan. And here we have in the Southern Baptist Convention calling Joe Biden patriotic is about like calling someone that don't support Israel patriotic. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, both are not patriotic. They're both on American positions. Here it says, let's give an example of the kind of thing that'll get written up in the history books about the crazy campaign of 2024. On Saturday night, Brent Leatherwood, president of the Southern Baptist Convention's Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, released a statement praising Biden's decision to drop out of the race, calling it extraordinary and the right decision. In a separate statement, Leatherwood calls it selfless. Now, here's the thing, Alan, that I just want to point out. Joe Biden did not drop out of the presidential race, though he will probably say that tonight in his speech to America. He didn't drop out of this race in the self-interest of the nation. He dropped out of the race because the Democrat elites around him told him that he didn't have no choice but to drop out. They forced him out of this campaign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 14 million Democrats voted for him to be the nominee, and the elites forced him out of this campaign and is forcing him to endorse Kamala Harris. There's nothing selfless about that. There's nothing patriotic about that. He's not putting the country's interests above his own. He was forced out of this race. And to be quite honest with you, with the damage he's done, I no longer feel sorry for Joe Biden, nor do I feel sorry for his family members. I think that they're guilty of elder abuse, and I think he's guilty of hanging around. To, he shouldn't have run the start with. He shouldn't have been no. president to start with. That's my take on it. And I can't believe we've got somebody high up in the Southern Baptist Convention that's willing to go to this length in political that's ways. Right. Yeah. This same yeah. person 
would not allow for a Southern Baptist pastor to get in his pulpit and That's preach right. Christian principles relative to government. But mm-hmm. yet he'll make this kind of a statement. I think that's poor. That's what it's disgusting. Yeah. It's, it's disgusting. disgusting. Where are you now? I'm at the third paragraph. Well, it says that caused outrage. His, his post about it being the right decision, extraordinary and selfless. It says that caused outrage within the Southern Baptist Convention, and it should have. And on Monday, the ERLC executive committee announced Leatherwood had been fired. However... Former ERLC president Russell Moore took umbrage to Leatherwood being ousted and raised the stink to secular anti-Christian media outlets. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, the executive committee did a 180, announcing Leatherwood was not fired, and instead the committee's chairman Kevin Smith ended up resigning. In its statement Tuesday announcing the reversal of the decision, the ERLC claimed Smith acted alone in firing Leatherwood. So you had one guy that stood up and said, no, this ain't right. It is the church going woke. Mm-hmm. That's all it is. And That's we've drawn say. parallels on the Smith and Rowland podcast for, for a couple of years now. We have drawn parallels between the government of the nation and mm-hmm. the government of the church. That's right. That's and that's, right. The apostate church is getting more apostate. If the remnant don't rise up, then there's no remnant there's left. No hope. That's well, right. that's what the book of Jude is all about, Jeff. Yeah. It's about the apostasy that's in the church right in the latter days, right before the rapture of the church, actually. Then that's what we are totally seeing right now. Absolutely. All right, what, you, what you got after that? It says uh, after multiple conversations with executive committee members, of the ERLC, I was convinced in my mind that we had had a consensus to remove Brett Leatherwood as the president of the ERLC. It is a delicate matter, and in an effort to deal with it expeditiously, I acted in good faith, but without a formal vote of the executive committee. This was an error on my part, and I accept full responsibility. It's just basically mm. politics in the church. Yeah, that's what it um, is. That's what it is. Uh, nobody, but it was over. It was over that statement about Biden. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So we're back to this thing of we've got Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. Those are the nominees for president to run for president of the United States. Mm -hmm. I got to say, Alan, and I'd love your take on this. And I'm back to the same question that we asked two years ago. We was asking the same question. Can you reconcile the platform and the policies of a Kamala Harris to your Christian faith? Can you reconcile that? It won't reconcile. In other words, that one and one doesn't make two. You cannot reconcile those books. And it's a scary thought to me that someone would, people, I guess, Jeff, have so separated a political stance from where they are personally, or they think they are personally. Somehow people have made such a distinction that the two are different, that they feel like they can be pro-abortion and still be somewhat Christian. Yeah. But the only thing I can tell you, abortion is a pagan activity. Homosexuality, marriage, that's pagan activities. I don't think we can any longer call these institutions a church. I totally agree. You could call it a pagan gathering. Sooner or later, we're going to have to call it what it is. And don't you think there's a lot of people sitting in the pews of these buildings that have Christian names on their sign? But they're basically advocating for pagan rituals mm-hmm. and pagan doctrines being taught. And people are still sitting there because that's the church they've went to for 50 years. Mm-hmm. At one time was a, a very strong church, maybe, that preached the gospel, that stood on the principles of the mm-hmm. kingdom of God. But now they no longer do. You know, I just I just think that it's that's the world we're now living in. Somehow or another, we need to blow a trumpet and see what what is God saying to us about these things. I don't even think that we any longer need to seek for a a word outside of the written word of God. The written word of God is there to guide us. Mm -hmm. We're just not following it. And we're not uh, following it in simplistic things, Jeff, that are elementary, that is Christianity 101. Yeah, that's right. And we're not even agreeing now in first grade education of Christianity, the topics that you learn there, we're failing at that now. So that's the reason I say I'm really hard-pressed to cause the Presbyterian churches. And I know there's different strains of those now. The ones we're talking about here, I find it hard to even call them a church. 
Uh, I, I just ha called it a pagan I, gathering I, I and be done totally with it. Agree. And to have this type of what's coming against our country today in spiritual things, Jeff, is somehow can our preachers of this country, you know, I just pray that they can turn up their, the anointing, that God will turn it up to where preaching once again will convict yeah. the hearts of the listeners. Yeah. 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 And unless that happens, I just don't know where we're going to be in two or three years from now. Can I just point something out? Man, you've had some discussions lately about preaching. Both of us have kind of recommitted in some ways to when we're up talking in front of people in a church setting that we're going back to more of an expository type method yes. of going line upon line, mm -hmm. precept upon precept, and trying to really exegete from the word, pull out right. what's there. And the reason is because I just had a conversation with somebody just a few minutes before we started about the church they were attending, and they offered to me that there's just no depth in the teaching at all. There's no depth there. And if there's no depth there, guess where you end up? You end up making foolish moves like the Presbyterian Church just made. Yeah, and well, if there's no depth, that means it's Matthew 13. There was a sower came and sowed, and some seed right. fell on the wayside. That was hard ground. It couldn't go deep. Yeah. There's some other soil. There was rocky soil. The word couldn't go deep. So to, yeah. to make your point. Well, and then Paul the Apostle says that in the last days would have a form of godliness. Mm -hmm. but we would deny the power thereof. Mm -hmm. It's becoming mm -hmm. obvious to me, at least in our country, that yeah. there is a lot of forms of godliness out there, but we're <laughs> denying the real power of the Word of God going forth and not allowing the Word of God to really penetrate the hearts of people anymore. It's just not mm -hmm. happening. It ends you up where we are. As yeah, the church goes, right. so goes the nation. And here we are. Well, yeah. Jeff, we're out of time today, buddy. Okay. We'll pick it up again, again here tomorrow. And we'll see what your soft, silky voice has to say then. The texture of my tones will be eloquent, and <laughs> oh it will God. be wonderful for the listeners. <laughs> okay. You know how it used to be at the end of a movie, you'd have a little cartoon. That was our <laughs> cartoon right there. Right. So say bye, <laughs> Jeff. Bye, world. Okay. Bye, world. Thank you for joining today's Smith & Rowan Show. You can check out our website at kingdompropheticsociety.org and our daily unplugged podcast at smithandrollinshow.podbean.com. You can also join us on Amazon, Apple, or Spotify.